When the battle was over, and all things coming into order, the Baron of Bradwardine, returning from the duty of the day, and having disposed those under his command in their proper stations, sought the chieftain of Glenacoich and his friend Edward Waverley. He found the former busied in determining disputes among his clansmen about points of precedence and deeds of valor, besides sundry high and doubtful questions concerning plunder. The most important of the last respected the property of a gold watch, which had once belonged to some unfortunate English officer. The party against whom judgment was awarded consoled himself by observing, she, that is, the watch, which she took for a living animal, died the very night Vichy and Vore gave her to Murdoch, the machine, having, in fact, stopped for want of winding up. It was just when this important question was decided that the Baron of Bradwardine, with a careful and yet important expression of countenance, joined the two young men. He descended from his reeking charger, the care of which he recommended to one of his grooms. I seldom ban, sir, said he to the man, but if you play any of your houndsfoot tricks, and leave poor Barrack before he's sorted, to rin after Squilsey, deal be why me if I do not give your Craig a thraw. He then stroked with great complacency the animal which had borne him through the fatigues of the day, and having taken a tender leave of him, will, my good young friends, a glorious and decisive victory, said he, but these loons of troopers fled ours soon. I should have liked to have shown you the true points of the prelium equester, or equestrian combat, whilk their cowardice has postponed, and which I hold to be the pride and terror of warfare. Will I have fought once more in this old quarrel, though I admit I could not be so far bent as you lads, being that it was my point of duty to keep together our handful of horse. And no cavalier ought in any wise to begrudge honour that befalls his companions, even though they are ordered upon thrice his danger, whilk, another time, by the blessing of God, may be his own case. But, Glenacoich, and you, Mr. Waverley, I pray ye to give me your best advice on a matter of mickle weight, and which deeply affects the honour of the house of Bradwardine. I crave your pardon, Ensign Mackambich, and yours, Inverafflin, and yours, Edrilshendrak, and yours, sir. The last person he addressed was Balancaric, who, remembering the death of his son, lowered on him with a look of savage defiance. The baron, quick as lightning at taking umbrage, had already bent his brow when Glenicoich dragged his major from the spot, and remonstrated with him, in the authoritative tone of a chieftain, on the madness of reviving a quarrel in such a moment. The ground is cumbered with carcasses, said the old mountaineer, turning sullenly away, one more would hardly have been kenned upon it, and if it wasn't for your cell, Vichy and Vore, that one should be Bradwardine's or mine. The chief soothed while he hurried him away, and then returned to the baron. It is Balancaric, he said, in an under and confidential voice, father of the young man who fell eight years since in the unlucky affair at the mains. Ah, said the baron, instantly relaxing the doubtful sternness of his features, I can take Micklefray a man to whom I have unhappily rendered sick a displeasure as that. You were right to apprise me, Glenicoich, he may look as black as midnight at Martin Air Cosmo Common Bradwardine shall say he does him rang. Ah! I have name male lineage, and I should bear with one I have made childless, though you are aware the blood wit was made up to your own satisfaction by a sithment, and that I have since expedited letters of slains. Well, as I have said, I have no male issue, and yet it is needful that I maintain the honour of my house, and it is on that score I prayed you for your peculiar and private attention. The two young men awaited to hear him, in anxious curiosity. I doubt na, nah, lads, he proceeded, but your education has been essay seen to that ye understand the true nature of the feudal tenures? Fergus, afraid of an endless dissertation, answered, intimately, barren, and touched Waverley as a signal to express no ignorance. And ye are aware, I doubt not, that the holding of the barony of Bradwardine is of a nature alike honourable and peculiar, being Blanche, which Craig opines ought to be Latinate Blancum, or rather Francum, a free holding, pro servicio detrahendi, seu ex wendi, caligas regis post battalium. Here Fergus turned his falcon eye upon Edward, with an almost imperceptible rise of his eyebrow, to which his shoulders corresponded in the same degree of elevation. Now, TWA points of dubitation occur to me upon this topic. First, whether this service, or feudal homage, 
be it any event due to the person of the prince, the words being, per expressum, caligas regis, the boots of the king himself, and I pray your opinion anent that particular before we proceed farther. Why, he is Prince Regent, answered Mac Ivor, with laudable composure of countenance, and in the court of France all the honours are rendered to the person of the regent which are due to that of the king. Besides, were I to pull off either of their boots, I would render that service to the young chevalier ten times more willingly than to his father. I, but I talk not of personal predilections. However, your authority is of great weight as to the usages of the court of France, and doubtless the prince, as alter ego, may have a right to claim the homagium of the great tenants of the crown, since all faithful subjects are commanded, in the commission of regency, to respect him as the king's own person. Far, therefore, be it from me to diminish the luster of his authority by withholding this act of homage, so peculiarly calculated to give it splendor, for I question if the emperor of Germany hath his boots taken off by a free baron of the empire. But here leath the second difficulty, the prince wears no boots, but simply brogues and trues. This last dilemma had almost disturbed Fergus's gravity. Why, said he, you know, Baron, the proverb tells us, it's ill taking the breeks off a highland man, and the boots are here in the same predicament. The word Caligi, however, continued the baron, though I admit that, by family tradition, and even in our ancient evidence, it is explained lie boots, means, in its primitive sense, rather sandals, and Caius Caesar, the nephew and successor of Caius Tiberius, received the ignomen of Caligula, a Caligula sign Caligis Levioribus, Cabus Attila century uses fewer at in exercita Germanis I patri sway. And the Caligi were also proper to the monastic bodies, for we read in an ancient glossarium upon the rule of St. Benedict, in the Abbey of St. Amund, that Caligi were tied with latchets. That will apply to the brogues, said Fergus. It will so, my dear Glenicoich, and the words are express. Caligi dicti sunt kia leganter, nam sochi non leganter, said tantum intramatunter, that is, Caligi are denominated from the ligatures wherewith they are bound, whereas sochi, which may be analogous to our mules, whilk the English denominate slippers, are only slipped upon the feet. The words of the charter are also alternative, exura seu detrahir, that is, to undo, as in the case of sandals or brogues, and to pull off, as we say vernacularly concerning boots. Yet I would we had more light, but I fear there is little chance of finding here about any erudite author de revestiaria. I should doubt it very much, said the chieftain, looking around on the straggling highlanders, who were returning loaded with spoils of the slain, though the residential vestiaria itself seems to be in some request at present. This remark coming within the baron's idea of jocularity, he honored it with a smile but immediately resumed what to him appeared very serious business. Bailey Macweeble indeed holds an opinion that this honorary service is due, from its very nature, as I peditor tantum, only if his royal highness shall require of the great tenant of the crown to perform that personal duty, and indeed he pointed out the case in Dalton's doubts and queries, Grip Pitt versus Spicer, anent the eviction of an estate ob non salutum canonum, that is, for non-payment of a fiduity of three peppercorns a year, Wilk were taxed to be worth seven-eighths of a penny Scots. In Wilk the defender was a soil seed. But I deem it safest, why your good favor, to place myself in the way of rendering the prince this service, and to proffer performance thereof, and I shall cause the bailey to attend with a schedule of a protest, Wilk he has here prepared, taking out a paper, intimating, that if it shall be his royal highness's pleasure to accept of other assistance at pulling off his caligi, whether the same shall be rendered boots or brogues, save that of the said Baron of Bradwardine, who is in presence. Ready and willing to perform the same, it shall in no wise impinge upon or prejudice the right of the said Cosmo Common Bradwardine to perform the said service in future, nor shall it give any esquire, valet of the chamber, squire, or page, whose assistance it may please his royal highness to employ, any right, title, or ground for evicting from the said Cosmo Common Bradwardine the estate and barony of Bradwardine, and others held as aforesaid, by the due and faithful performance thereof. Fergus highly applauded this arrangement, and the baron took a friendly leave of them, with a smile of contented importance upon his visage. 
Long live our dear friend the Baron, exclaimed the chief, as soon as he was out of hearing, for the most absurd original that exists north of the Tweed. I wish to heaven I had recommended him to attend the circle this evening with a bootcatch under his arm. I think he might have adopted the suggestion if it had been made with suitable gravity. And how can you take pleasure in making a man of his worth so ridiculous? Begging pardon, my dear Waverley, you are as ridiculous as he. Why, do you not see that the man's whole mind is wrapped up in this ceremony? He has heard and thought of it since infancy as the most august privilege and ceremony in the world, and I doubt not but the expected pleasure of performing it was a principal motive with him for taking up arms. Depend upon it, had I endeavoured to divert him from exposing himself he would have treated me as an ignorant, conceited coxcomb, or perhaps might have taken a fancy to cut my throat, a pleasure which he once proposed to himself upon some point of etiquette not half so important, in his eyes, as this matter of boots or brogues, or whatever the caligi shall finally be pronounced by the learned. But I must go to headquarters, to prepare the prince for this extraordinary scene. My information will be well taken for it will give him a hearty laugh at present, and put him on his guard against laughing when it might be very mal a propos. So, au revoir, my dear Waverley.